Hello and welcome to Ask the Accountant. We have cool friends and I think today's episode we need to change it to we have cool celebrities. We do have celebrities. Yeah, we have oh. actual celebrities in the room today. So I feel like they don't need an introduction, but I think the best etiquette is to get make them to introduce themselves. So please, Joe and Zoe, introduce to the one person who may not know who you are. Oh, it's so funny. We meet people all the time who have no idea who we are and loads of bookkeepers, but we are Joe and Zoe from The Six Figure Bookkeeper. We are co-hosts of The Bookkeeper's podcast and we are authors of The Bookkeeper Rises. We have a community on Facebook of nearly 25,000 bookkeepers and accountants globally and we help bookkeepers with the skills that they don't learn at college with business skills and, and confidence really. Yeah, I always think it's like we talk about pricing and selling and marketing, but really it comes down to confidence. Like that's the number one thing, isn't it? Yeah. Amazing. Can we start at the beginning though? Can we start of the story of how you two met? I assume it was over a, a drink sometime or, you know, let's let's really romanticise this. But honestly, like what are you two backgrounds? How have you kind of got together? Can we just have a bit of a brief a story of where, how this brand got together? Okay. So... We were strangers and not everyone knows that. They assume that we've known each other for years or sometimes people said, are you sisters? But we were complete strangers until about 2019. So I've been running um, a bookkeeping practice of sorts, multiple since about 2003, just after the birth of my first child. And I had been a great bookkeeper, but a rubbish business owner. And I didn't realise that I needed to be good at both. So over the years, I had struggled with building a practice, running a team, and my health had really struggled. So much so that in 2016, after nearly dying, and I'm not even exaggerating, I had so many operations in that year. And there was a point where they told my husband, prepare yourself, she might not make it, that I left the profession for a while because I thought, I can't get this to work. I actually went into network marketing and started selling aloe vera, of all things. But what I learned through network marketing was a different way of doing business. It was about attraction marketing, building a brand, social media, focusing on mindset, and focusing on what you want and what you're trying to achieve. And after a while, I fell out of love with the network marketing world. And I thought to myself, what if I bring these two things together? Have I learned enough? And I didn't feel I'd learned enough to get the bookkeeping business to work. So I invested in a business coach. I just lost my dad, actually. And I, it was one of those points and he was 57 when he passed. And I thought, you've got to get this sorted. You've got to get this together. So I invested in this coach and she talked to me about building a brand and also sharing my story. So at that time, 2018, I thought, right, I'm going to start my fifth and final bookkeeping practice. And I'm going to build a community and share my journey as accountability at the same time. So that's what I did. I started the Six Figure Bookkeepers Club in 2018. And then in 2019, I met Zoe a couple of times. First time we met, we was consulting with the ICB over a management accounts paper. But I thought Zoe was so cool because she was zoomed in like this is pre-COVID. So she was on this big screen. I was there in person in London and she was on this big screen. And you just had Wilf and you was feeding him and you were like, oh, she's like writing notes, feeding the baby. And I was like, oh, you're so cool. Even though I had three children at that time, I had consistently tried to hide the fact that I was a mother because I felt that that was making me a bad business person. So when I saw that in Zoe, I was like, I want to be like her. <laughs> and then there was a time when everyone went to lunch and it was just me and Zoe and I was sitting there at, at the table and, she, and we just got chatting. And um, I thought, oh, I, I really like Zoe. And then there was a time when I was at ZeroCon and she rocked up with the baby in a push chair. And I'm like, oh my God, she's so cool. And <laughs> even someone said to me yesterday, like, did Zoe start off the dress and pumps thing? Because like everyone remembers, you just look so cool. You were like rocking a dress and pumps with a baby. But I think what you don't realise from that time was I really struggled with having babies. So like from a mental health point of view, I had to not just be at home with the babies. Like, with my first daughter and, you know, my journey is I started working as an accountant straight from school. I went to university actually to do an accounting degree and my mum struggles with her mental health. So that knowing that and almost feeling like I am going to struggle with my mental health when I have children, 
it was like I was so worried that was the future. I left uni, mum couldn't cope with me at home. And I got a job as a trainee accountant. So I've been an accountant forever since I was about 19. And I was really focused on this idea that I need security. I need to put a roof over my own head if I'm an employee and I'm a good girl and I get things done. You know, I bought a house when I was 19 because I was like, I have to take responsibility for myself. So a lot of my journey and a lot of my mindset around being self-employed goes back to that. I, I can't risk it. I can't take risks. I've got to do the safe thing. And like we see that a lot with bookkeepers now as well, you know, the real fear of taking that leap or, you know, not just side hustling, but having a business. But then when I had Heidi, my daughter, who's um, seven now, that was 2016. And I, I was working for a bank. I was doing some massive consolidation. Like, it was like a faceless number processing job. And we worked long hours and quarter ends were horrible. I was like, I'm not going to be able to do this with a baby. So I need to plan to do something else. And maybe I could just work part time and I could do a bit of bookkeeping on the side so I can be with Heidi a little bit more. And I did all my ICB exams. So I'm, I'm an ACCA accountant. I thought, well, I've never been in practice, so I'll never be able to get my license, which we know is actually wrong. But that's a story for another day, maybe. And I did my ICB exams and became a bookkeeper and then sort of started my business and networking and all of the things that we talked to bookkeepers about. And then I actually went back to work because I was afraid to be self-employed. And I remember my husband saying to me one day, like I'd taken a call on a Sunday and, and we were like trying to have a nice afternoon at the park. And he's like, oh my God, you've got to just like, how much money did you earn last month? And I was like, oh, it was about £1,700. He's like, right, you have to leave your job or stop being self-employed. So we had to make a bit of a plan then. And then I thought, right, I've really got to go for this. And then you started coming into my life. So when I, you saw me with Wilf, who is two years younger than Heidi, I was like desperately trying to not be at home. And, you know, I, I remember taking him to ZeroCon, which is not easy. <laughs> like I always moan about going to the Excel. It's such a pain to get to the Excel. I say it every year. And it's only because I can remember changing Wolf's nappy on like the lap tray that comes on the <laughs> day. So in my mind, I'm still going with a baby. So I don't think it was like a cool thing. It was like a coping thing. Yeah. It's perception, isn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah. So, yeah, we met then. And then the next time we met after that, was we were both invited to speak at the ICB Summit in 2019. Mm. And I spoke on stage about how I was starting and creating a six-figure bookkeeping business from my kitchen table. Because again, I was saying to everyone, I'd learned this whole, if you put it out there, you'll create it. I had a lot of, yeah, but you're not a six-figure bookkeeper yet, though, are you? And I'm like, well, no, but if we don't put the, I was trying to explain to these people, but I'm not being fake. It was like people were thinking I was faking it until I made it. And that's not, that wasn't what I was doing. I was creating my future and I had to talk about it to make it a reality. And I think that was a bit misunderstood. But then Zoe got on stage and made everyone do a visualization. And I was like, oh my gosh, she's my girl. She is my girl. And looking around at the time, we were different to the rest of who we were in, who were in the room. They all thought we were a bit weird. Oh, it's a funny thing. Yeah. Because the reason I, you were there talking about building a six figure business, I'd just written Know Your Numbers, which was a market, it was a lead magnet, right? And I was like, well, I've done, I did this while Wilf was breastfeeding in the night and all that stuff because I had to keep my mind sane and not be just scrolling Twitter, which was the alternative. And I remember doing that and looking around and the amount of people with their eyes open going, I'm not visualizing anything. I'm, I'm do not believe in this. <laughs> and also, everyone was like, who is this woman who is. <laughs> has got a newborn baby and has just written the book while they're feeding at night. Like everyone was like, and I was like, I need her energy in my life. So as she stepped off stage, I said to her, I've got this business idea and I really want to share it with you. And I think, you know, I think you'll be, you'll be great in it. And I remember her looking at me like I had three heads, like we don't know each other that well. What are you talking about? And now knowing Zoe and her appetite for risk, I can see why she thought, get away from me. I'm never, you weirdo, starting a business with you. But what happened was over the next few weeks, we started to have chats on Saturdays. You'd usually be pushing a pram around the park. I'd be doing something at home. And we would talk and the conversations were getting longer and longer. And in the end, by, so that was the November, by the January, we was like, shall we meet up? Mm. So very strangely, we booked an Airbnb in Reading, which is halfway between Bristol and Kent, because we are the Gavin and Stacey, as well as the Anton Deck of the bookkeeping world. <laughs> 
and you've since told me how nervous you were. So I people pleased and bought you stationery because that's what I do and like took biscuits and things and tried to set up and I was like oh which room do I want which one's the best one oh I should give the best one to Zoe and she just didn't turn up for a while because she just kept walking around I just went to m and I was just like walking <laughs> I was like oh god I gotta go and hang out with this lady I, this is so weird I was so out of my comfort zone yeah we both were but what happened was when we got together and we had some tea and started talking about the business we ended up creating the Six Figure Bookkeeper. We created the website. We incorporated the business. We created the program. And then you said to me, what are we going to, we did say to me, what are we going to call it? And I said, well, I've kind of got this group that I've been running for a couple of years now that's called the Six Figure Bookkeepers Club. And she was like, why don't we use that? I was like, it's got about 60 people in it. But that's all I needed for that accountability at the time. And actually, so we was like, well, let's run with that. So to now say that we've nearly got 25,000 it took me a long time to get those first 60. And we built, we built it, we incorporated and we set up the website. And from that point on, I think we knew it was, it was going to work. Yeah. And we've had like, we've obviously had a bit of a journey over, but well, it was COVID pretty much like straight after that. We had that meetup in Reading, which was January 2020. And then we had a photo shoot, <laughs> which was like, it was like we were uh, like getting, it was our engagement shoot. Um, we were so awkward with each other because we didn't know how to just be, because we weren't friends. Yeah. yeah. So we didn't know how to take a photo. And I was like, oh my God, we look like we're getting married. And <laughs> and we did it in a hotel. It really It looked- was really dark. Like there was like the, I don't know, there was just loads of things I look at it and I'm like, oh my God, our hair was weird. <laughs> Everything was weird. We, we didn't have our brand. We didn't know how to be with each other. But we had a few drinks afterwards and we got to we got to know each other and then March happened and we didn't see each other again in person until September 2021. But in that time, we built the business. I love that. And and during that time, just just to jump in there, there was it was Vlogmas. You guys did Vlogmas with us? Oh yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh my god. That was that time as well, wasn't yes. it? During the thing. And that, that was when I first came to know what you guys were and what you guys were all about but yeah i remember the vlog you were wearing a christmas hat yeah yeah, yeah we all tried to do a pass and i think i was that's, invited no no you <laughs> <laughs> completely my fault i emailed you uh you emailed me back and i um accidentally forgot to uh, reply to the email we weren't friends by then <laughs> oh interesting so, yeah i want to just go back to that story where you were saying about being on stage I'm talking about aspiring to be a six-figure bookkeeper and everyone going, oh, well, you're not yet. I, it always baffles me how judgmental we are mm. of, of adults in general who are aspiring to be something. You don't turn around to a child who says, I'm going to be an astronaut and go, well, you're not because we don't have a space program in the UK. <laughs> like, <laughs> but you're not an astronaut, though, are you? You just want to be one. Like, we, we wouldn't ever judge a child for that. Why do we judge adults in, the, in that way? I think we're judging ourselves. Yeah. In that moment, whatever we're judging someone else, it's just a ref- self-reflection, isn't it? Yeah. That whole judging of people, that changes when you, which you've then built. Yeah. Full of brilliant accountants and bookkeepers. So the core message when you started was, we want to help you get from starting out or wherever you are at the moment mm. to a six-figure bookkeeping business. And I think that was the misconception as well. So for me, a six-figure bookkeeping business meant the money. Mm-hmm. I had a mortgage. I just lost a finance director role where I, was, I knew that with costs and things, I needed to turn over that amount. But the message was for everyone else, what does six figures look like for you? What is your goal? What's the aspiration? You've created this monster job that you might as well go and work at Asda and be happy and you'll be earning mostly more because yeah. that's what I knew to be true. I owed my company more money. We were on tax credits. Like our director's loan accounts were getting bigger. Like I know I would have been better off working at Asda. So what I meant by that was not that you have to aspire to have a £100,000 plus turnover business, but what do you want? What does six figures as an aspiration look like for you? Yeah. And you were saying about this sort of judgment. I think we, particularly with bookkeeping, because lots of people become bookkeepers as a sort of second choice career. And it's at a time where you might lack confidence in yourself. You're doing it as a, oh, well, I suppose I could just go and do this. And then you're naturally in that space where you are doubting yourself. And it's really difficult to say, I'm allowed to do this. 
Like I, I am okay. I'm allowed to go out and have an aspiration to hit six figures or whatever it is for it's me. Almost having because mm. let's be stereotyping here. So apologies, but ultimately, the statistics show most bookkeepers are women that have had a baby. Yeah. Kid has started school or playgroup and they're trying to get back into it, but they want some flexibility. So they go self-employed as a bookkeeper. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the confidence of I'm allowed to have a career or something, but it's also actually I'm not so-and-so's mum. That's not my identity. Yeah. I'm not so-and-so's husband. That's yeah. not my identity. Yeah. I am this person. I run this business and I have a husband and kids or yeah. I have kids or whatever the family situation is. It's not just a confidence thing, is it? It's more of a there's a lot of things going on there. <sighs> Yeah. For the majority of people that are going into bookkeeping, when they go into it, like we spoke to Millie today from TCS, like she's gone into bookkeeping, kind of fell into it because yeah. she wasn't sure what she wanted to do, but she's just gone into it very young and gone, oh, I really like this, this is really good. She's got her challenges, but actually that's probably an easier route into bookkeeping when you come out of school, not sure what you want to do, you stumble into it, you find out actually you're quite like this. And you carry on with it, then going into it after having a baby and yeah. trying to run a family. Like everyone always says, how how do you do everything you do? Yeah, and it's like, well, I don't have a family. Like I have an extraordinarily tolerant wife, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't have kids and stuff, so I don't have that pressure. I think there's like hormonal changes as well, you know, like I was talking about mental health, but we we speak about the menopause a lot, perimenopause, your hormones are all over the place when you've just had a baby, like your priorities are completely shifted, your body changes, your confidence change, if your body has changed and you're not the person that you were and that you identify with being, all that changes everything. Yeah. And when you're compromising because you think, oh, I need to earn money around my health, my children, maybe you're looking after parents and caring for somebody, whatever the situation is, you're coming into this as a career because you need compromise and flexibility. So therefore you come in not thinking of yourself as a professional, as someone that's adding value. You're seeing that this is going to give you something rather than that you're here to give it to somebody else. And so that's where we find that the issue with pricing initially starts. And I love that Millie has started, like, this is my like one of our missions is like, what happened if people started to choose this? Yeah. yeah. Choose this because it looks cool. Yeah. It looks fun. It looks like an amazing opportunity. And I believe that it is, but that's not the story we have been sold. Yep. You know, little wifey in the corner. I saw it even on a, a program this week. There was a drama. There was a very like this powerful husband. He was a detective and the wife was looking after the three kids at home. And she was like, I need something for myself. I think I'm just going to go into bookkeeping. And I'm like, oh my God, and this is this was created. And he was like, oh, you don't really need to do that. Like it's looked as a pity yeah. role. And I'm like, we've still got so much work to do around this. I think one of the things that we've got in our defense now is we have got people like Millie. We've got the graces of the world. We've got people going mm -hmm. on social media, showing the real, you know, what their day-to-day -day life is like. And we were terrible at that before, weren't we? Mm -hmm. We... We, we, we were just stuck in our st stereotypical world and we were just, that was all we knew, right? And I think you guys started, you know, changing that. Like you brought a group together that meant people can talk about menopause and, and, and everything else. You started a podcast, which surely when it started, no one else was doing podcasting, right? Now, now everyone does. Oh but... my gosh, our podcast was a joke at the beginning. <laughs> It was called Breakfast with the 6FB. No one knew who the 6FB were. Who did we think we were? We, and and we never looked, had breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> and, and people still ask us now, where are episodes? Is it one to five? They're like, where are they? We're like, they're just so bad. No one can ever see them. We're like more. And we, I mean, we're nearly at 300 episodes. The thing is, the beauty of when you have a very busy life, we have five children between us and we were both running practices and we we're both trying to build this community. When you're that busy and that stressed, we had to create structure. Mm -hmm. And we said like 1 p.m. on a Wednesday every week, we'll do a podcast. We didn't really, we didn't know what a podcast was. We've never, you know, we've come to you today and see yourself. Ours is not like this. Ours is just a chat. We're in two different countries and you know, now we've invested a bit more in microphones and things like that. But it's we've also done it so that we wanted to meet our community where they're at, yeah. at yeah. home, yeah. on their own. And so we've always toyed with 
how professional do we, you know, want to make it look because they love the fact that my dog turns up or, you know, the doorbell rings and so he's like, oh, just got to get the door. We never profess to be, I mean, we don't, I've never called myself a podcaster in those. We say we're the co-host of the bookkeepers, but I've never called myself a podcast. That feels yeah. weird. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah I said that. And actually, I think we found as things have got more successful and we think, oh, we need to level up. Yeah. But, you know, zero sponsor our podcast now. So like, we're like, we want to do a really good job for zero. Like that's important to us. But at the same time, we don't want to alienate ourselves from our client base. Like we don't run practices anymore. I closed mine during COVID. Jo sold her practice last year. And so we have created like a bit of a separation, but we need our clients to know that we understand them. We understand business. We can support them. There are lots of ways that we bring other bookkeepers and accountants into support anyway. But if we were to go off and be like, oh, you know, we're podcasters now and here's our like fancy studio, it might feel very different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot less relatable at that point, isn't it? Yeah. And I think it's simple things like, oh, Zoe's got to go and get the door because the doorbell rung. And they're like, that happens to me on Zoom calls with my clients all the time. Yeah. It's obviously acceptable because it's happening and it's with okay. Zoe. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Celebrities yeah. can do it. We can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Not celebrities. We're not celebrities. And do you know, and that is the biggest thing I think about the whole journey is that we have had to create something in our space that has not been there before. And so we knew we were going to get people saying, who do they think they are? And that's fine because we'd all naturally do that. So when I stood on stage and said, I'm making a six-figure bookkeeping business from my kitchen table, I had not seen anyone else do or say that, but I knew that I had to create it so that other, and now look at how many people are doing it because it's both. And that's partly the reason why I sold my practice. <laughs> Was I ready? Was it? In the no, none of that. It wasn't at the point. But when the offer came about from Johan, <laughs> I thought, "Whoa, I don't know anyone else that's done this. If I do it, it then makes it a possibility." And now, like, and now every time I speak with bookkeepers, they're like, "I'm thinking of selling in the future. Or I'm I'm creating an exit strategy." We talk about exit strategy again. It's like you have to create the things that aren't there so that it feels possible because you have to see it to believe it. We were talking to somebody yesterday, actually, and she was saying, oh, you know, I, I've, I've just heard this person share their story. We've been at a bookkeeping event and the lady was speaking on stage about building her business and putting her prices up and things. And the lady we were speaking to was saying, well, I still charge by the hour, but I've just heard this talk and I'm like, now I need to do fixed pricing. I'm like, it's only when you've seen it that you realise that that is in, that could be in your future. Yeah. And you've actually spoken to that person and got the yeah. ins and outs of it. The thing is, that person's probably actually heard people talk about pricing and fixed prices. 20 times yes but it just so happens that that person on stage has put it into terminology or some kind of case scenario kind of situation where she could that person's just gone i can relate to that i see what i need to do now we hear that all the time so we teach our uh, success program live so i think we're on a third round of teaching it live and we have people coming back every time because they say i'm in a different space now to hear this differently this time. I know I know this, but now I'm at a point where I can actually take action. So I think that is the thing. We, we feel like we sometimes repeat ourselves and say the same things. But every time we teach the programme, we approach it differently because we know new things and that's okay. And that's why it's, it bugs me when people go, I've read 50 different business books this year. This year. It's not, Great, well done. Yeah, what did you do though? What have you yeah. done? You've <laughs> taken no action. But the amount of books that I go back and reread almost annually, and I take something new out of it every time mm -hmm. because it's just a, I'm in a different place with something. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. You have to choose like which are the the handful of Bibles that I'm going to live my life by, yeah. and mm -hmm. because otherwise it it's too much information. I think that overwhelm is real, isn't it? Hundred percent becomes noise, and that's the biggest thing is actually implementing and taking action. That is something that I think the fact we have being very busy people and also having each other we're quite different like you guys are being you know in a partnership having two of you I heard um is Brenny Brown talk about this about marriage about it's not 50 50 it depends on the day sometimes someone has to take 90 percent and the other one needs a lie down and Zoe and I yeah. find that we are really good at the the yin and yang of sometimes I've got more energy Sometimes I've got a stinking cold and she will pick it up. But, but also the other thing is we, we have this thing where 
we constantly feel like we're not doing enough and the other one's better than us and we want to do better. And that makes us take a lot of action. And we often talk about the fact that no one really speaks about partnerships like this no. in a way. And we spoke to someone yesterday, that lady that was, oh, I don't want to have the conversation about this pricing. And she had a team member. She was like, I'll do it. I'll talk yeah. to them because you're amazing at what you do. I can sell you. And sometimes we need to know that it's not always, we're not always the best person for everything. Actually, we should be collaborating a lot more with other people. Yeah, we put so much on ourselves, don't we? And all of those books that everyone's reading and not taking action. How do you take the action? That's what's going to make the difference. Definitely. So as you've just referred to there, you are busy people. I mean, you're not long back from Canada, mm, from yeah. Accountex Canada, which looked and sounds amazing. Brilliant. Not jealous you know what? at there, all. There were so many bookkeepers. Like that, it was really interesting. Yeah, 80%. it's so different to a UK event. Yeah, it was a really positive, lovely environment. Really cool people, really lovely, but they're in a completely different space and they're not regulated. And it was, yeah, very different audience, but really good fun. And like, wow, it felt like a small world in many, pla- in many things because people were like, oh, I follow your podcast or we're only here because we saw you mention it on TikTok. <laughs> like, oh, this is mad. Yeah. But it was good. So... With all that busyness, though, obviously, work-life balance, family time is important. That's why you both went into the careers you did. Yeah. How are you managing that busyness, that family life on top, and still focusing on that core of people that you're trying to support, those core members that you set out to support from day one? Well, it needs to be a team effort. Yeah. We have an amazing team. We have amazing ambassadors who support us, bookkeepers and accountants in our community. They're working in practice. So they're, yeah. they're coming with like, this is what I'm using. This works for me. They'll, you know, as much as we feel we can answer the questions, sometimes it's like, actually, you should speak to this person. So we're like, actually, let's bring those people into the community. So knowing that you're not, you're not, like, the ego we're not the go. guru. No. We are not gurus. No. We are really good connectors of people. Yeah, we're facilitators. That's what we're really good at. And Zoe and I work really hard. But we also have very strict boundaries. So like today, we've actually sat down and we reassess our perfect week all the time and say, right, what's not working? So at the moment, we've decided that we're going to start doing meetings and things from 10 a.m. Because, you know, I've got three kids, you've got two kids, there's school runs, there's husbands, we need to be, you know, there's food shopping and cleaning and all of that stuff to do, right? So we start meetings at 10 a.m. and we finish at 3 Mm-hmm. And we have very odd meetings because of global, maybe some things in the evening. We have a Monday night, 8 p.m. masterclass that we do. But other than that, at three o'clock, we are done with. But now, does it mean we stop working? Of course not. Do we. Can I mention what we do in the mornings? <laughs> Go on, tell them. They'll love it. <laughs> so from about seven o'clock in the morning, we have naked admin. <laughs> so. Us and our team, we were like showering. Obviously, we're not competing. This isn't, no one sees this anything. Isn't like in the schedule, just to say it. it's just like a turn in the we team. Just up this is a separate package. <laughs> you are. <laughs> yeah. Coaching. We just laugh that we get so much done. So we don't start until 10 a.m. But between those hours of like half six and eight a.m., yeah. while we're all getting dressed and ready for the day, we are answering WhatsApps, voice noting, and we just laugh because sometimes we've accidentally done the video call and we're all in our towels or whatever and we're like oh naked admin so we crack up so yes we have the time where we're not but we're always connected with our team and we always are very aware that family is first our health is first we've been away for a couple of days but then we will make sure that in our schedule that we have some quieter time I'm meant to be at something this evening we've had a chat and I'm like it's not right I need to I need to go home I need to put family first but that's a great thing as well with having someone else. I'm very protective of Zoe and her kids' time. We actually have had a chat recently and I've said, right, actually school holidays, you're not working. Mm. Now, you will work. Yeah. But what we're going to do is not have big projects or big meetings in the diary and we're going to work things around because I feel, Zoe, I'm a very much an empath. So if Zoe gets stressed, I feel stressed. And Zoe's constantly trying to not make me feel stressed. <laughs> so we need to look off. Um, we, so we're quite good at gauging with that so and I think we you know we've been through a lot of family stuff the last few years you know like bereavements my husband had cancer last year 
like there's been so much going on and I think you have to flex it. I think like you said about the yin and yang of sometimes someone does more and someone else does more. What's really lovely about the way we work and what our sort of deliverables are every week, because we were talking about this this morning, weren't we? There's like the work that we do with our client base, the people who are working with us in our programs, and there has to be a repeatable structure for that that happens every week. We know what happens on which days. There's marketing activity. You know what happens on each day. People in the team have different KPIs. They know what they have to do on which day. Which email do we expect to go out when? You know, so those kind of things can be really structured. And and we've really sort of stripped back what do we do? Like we've cha- we don't sell individual courses anymore. We've put things into one membership. It's so much easier to manage and everyone can be on the same page. But I think it's just like being aware of like, what are we letting sort of creep in and how do, mm. how do we stop that? Because we're still people pleasers. <laughs> and we still say no less frequently than we say yes. Yeah. And aren't you kind of generating the right culture as well? Because if you guys are doing it from the top and you're setting your boundaries and you're putting it through there, they're the bread and butter of who you want to bring into your your community, right? And if you guys are sharing it and sharing how it can be done, how successful have you seen others being able to adopt it? Is, is it is it contagious? Have you been seen? Have you seen people in your community doing exactly the same? Yeah. Yeah. But I mean. Don't know if you know Leander Dado. Like she's traveling with her family, taking the kids out of school. You know, my youngest is now homeschooled, and that was something that I struggled with to talk about first because I had some shame. That was my own shame coming up and thinking, "Oh, I failed as a parent." But actually, the more I talk about anything that I feel is a failure, you just find more people that are going, "Oh my goodness, we're doing the same." My kids are struggling at school. We sat at the table last night, and a very high up person said, "Can I actually talk to you more about homeschooling?" Because I think we might need to do that. The more you talk about things that you are ashamed of, the more people you find that are feeling exactly the same as you. And this is why what we're doing is actually, yeah, bookkeeping is one tiny little bit. It's actually how do you be a parent and how do you be a woman and how do you be a wife? All these things, all these hats, all these things that we are juggling, we just keep having to share. And yeah, like bereavement, cancer, all of these health issues, we... The things that you think, shouldn't really talk about that in public, a bit like naked admin that I've just mentioned, <laughs> the more we just say it, either people are going to go, you're my kind of person and I respect you for saying it, or they're going to go, that's not my thing and I don't want to be associated with you. And that's absolutely fine. Yeah, But yeah. if anything, that just saves you constantly messaging someone that actually was probably never going to be yeah. the ideal client for you guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When I send out a bulk email to all of my clients and anyone, like prospects or anything, like I sent out a, bu- a budget summary the other day. Yeah. Three prospects that have been on our list for bloody ages came back saying, can you unsubscribe me? It's like, yes. Yeah. yeah. Because they're not. Yes. It's, not, it's all automated, send me, so it doesn't really save me any time, but it means I'm not boring you. Yes. You obviously don't care. And that's yeah. fine. Yeah, exactly. Mm, yeah. I'm okay with that. Yeah. yeah. I, I sort of subscribe to the view that like the way it's really hard to be a parent and a business owner and earn money like we were never meant to have children in this way like we were if you think back to our ancestors we were supposed to have a baby live in like a commune where everyone takes a role in like looking after the babies and you know someone gets to sleep and someone goes and gathers the food and that kind of thing we don't live like that so we just walked past didn't we the hospital around the corner it was called the lion in hospital for women after pregnancy we were like we want to go to a lion in hospital <laughs> <laughs> that is a ho- that's not that old I mean, it's, yeah. but not that, and i'm like that it's doesn't changed. happen anymore so there's like so much pressure and everyone like we're all giving ourselves such a hard time oh my god i'm such a bad business person i'm such a bad mom i'm doing i'm failing everything no no we we are doing amazing work but joe and i just want to show you if you change a few things it's going to be so much easier so we do have to lead the way yeah yeah so you guys like effective ways of working because you want to spend more time with family. Yeah. I like an effective way of working because I'm lazy. <laughs> yeah. Actually, having lazy people, though, in your team or around you is a really good thing to do because they find ways of doing things. We sometimes, if you're a busy person, you overcomplicate it. So I, you need all these different types of people in yeah. your world and, and, and watch them and think, why are you doing it that way? Because, yeah. I think teenagers are great at like finding ways of doing things because they just can't be asked, can they? And um, but they they find effective ways. Yeah, well, it's like my wife moaned at me at the weekend. That tumble dryer finished twenty minutes ago. So yeah, but I'm, like the dog was out an hour ago, 
give it another 10, 15 minutes. The dogs are going to want to get out. So I'll let the dog out and I'll get the stuff out of the tumble dryer at the same time. <laughs> and then I'll put the kettle on on my way past as well. Yeah. yeah. Because that's more effective. Otherwise, I'm getting up three times, aren't I? Yeah. Why so, would you do that? Yeah. Some call it lazy. <laughs> I call it an effective way of working. Yeah. <laughs> Being effective with how you spend your time is exactly what you guys are saying here, isn't it? Like, yes, you want to spend time with family. Yes, you want to be a good business person. The only way you're going to do that is by managing your time, learning from others. Yeah. And accepting that not everything's going to be perfect. Yeah. Especially when there's kids involved. Yeah. yeah. Never, go- never going to be perfect. <laughs> so what is ahead for you two? I mean, there's been a lot of change over the last two years from families to yeah. business decisions to touring and going on to Accountex Canada and, you know, all that good stuff. So... Mm. What's what's the course of the six figure bookkeepers for the next year or so? Like, what's the goals? Yeah, we've done so much learning. Like, we've we spent a lot of time investing in ourselves and trying to work out who are the right people to spend time with. So we get that. Like, what's that next level thinking? And we've been on a bit of ev- evolution. I feel like we're often working with a group of people and they're like okay great we've learned that and then we've stepped up and I think we've done quite a lot of stepping up and we're in a really nice place in terms of the voices that we have around us and the sort of support network that we have as business owners we've actually changed the way that we support our community with our paid programs so we have a membership called the bookkeepers collective which means that we can give our community for one subscription access to everything we know so it's not we're not saying oh buy this but you won't quite be finished and then you've got to buy this next thing which I felt like it's maybe been before because we just we want to know that we can support people through all of those different changes and you know they can keep going back looking for the next step we've also got some like bigger missions that we work on that you might not see I mean obviously we do lots of partnerships and we work with Zero and we've we've got a, a partnership we're working on with Mimo at the moment but we are trying to build some really good positive impact into what we do as well Earlier this year, we set ourselves a mission to positively impact a million children in poverty by helping their parents to earn more from bookkeeping. Because going back to those stories we shared with you about our own background, I know Jo didn't really go into hers so much, but my my journey, my mum was a single mum in the 80s and 90s. The way you earned money as a single mum who who couldn't struggled with, you know, sort of having a job around children and mental health and things was you did things like host foreign students from the language school and you know things like that all the side hustles she did Avon like all those things very hard to earn money doing those kind of things and sometimes we look at bookkeeping we're like oh my god it's exactly the same nothing's changed we're in 2024 and people are still struggling to make money around their kids so if we can impact the children who aren't are experiencing some level of poverty by helping their parents with bookkeeping which we can do through our programs but also through other wider giving opportunities that's a really good thing. So we're really working on that. That's all built into our programs. I think we've we, made... We do a lot of... People don't know about this and we don't talk about it, but there's scholarships and things. We, if we hear of somebody that's struggling, we have given so much away and we have lots of people that are in our programs for free for a time. Maybe they're going through health issues. Maybe they're just going through struggle of whatever. And um, we've kind of got policy, haven't we, that me and you can just make a decision without each other's knowledge. And we just go, yeah, that's fine. And that's been really good. We had to work a lot on autonomy of making decisions when you're in a partnership. Yeah. yeah. When you don't want to keep busy in people, especially like trying to get that work-life balance. If somebody's having a day, I need to be able to make a decision. And then we've, what we've done is with our team, how do we help them make those decisions? We've done a lot of this work on our values over the last year. And I think that's really helped us. We kind of see this year as let's continue doing this like perfect repeatable week. Let's give the best we can do. We've got loads of events coming up. We've also got Hey Monica that we're working on. Yeah. Again, something else on the side. Let's have the rewards of the last four years and have some calm. Yeah. I feel like we've settled. We, we, we feel really we've settled. We've got to a this bit point more grown of up. we know what we do. These are, the, yeah. these are the things we do and this is what has to happen every week to make that possible. Yeah. You've mentioned Hey Monica, so I'm going to take that as an opportunity to talk about Hey Monica. Tell us about Hey Monica. What is that? So in the community, obviously, we have lots of voices. And the thing we hear the most is I'm qualified. I'm a qualified accountant. I'm a qualified bookkeeper. 
I have everything I need to start this business. I now have the business skills. You've told me the business skills. You've, you've helped me with that. But I don't know how to actually do the work. What happens? How do I get the work off of the client? What does that look like? How do I onboard a client? How do I physically do this? And we, we've had this conversation so many times and we've had some amazing ambassadors and mentors, but bookkeepers that take other, this is the thing we have created, which was not the thing we set out to create, but our community are amazing. And they will take someone and say, come and watch me on Zoom. Come at, we have co-working sessions, don't yeah. we? And people share all the time. But how do we impact those million children with their parents with these bookkeeping skills unless we can create something that has that we can leverage that because not everybody can have an apprentice mentor how do we create or that mentor the pay cut like a yeah. lot of the times yeah. the challenge is you've tra- you've retrained as a bookkeeper you want to go and be self-employed but you don't have the confidence to actually do the workflow, even though we know you do. You'll you'll work it out. But, you know, a lot of people don't have that confidence or that kind of attitude. And they think, well, I've got to pay, take a pay cut. I can't afford to take a pay cut because I've got my family to support. I can't, I'm you know. pay for all this training. Yeah. So, so it's that. There is this massive problem where people don't have the hours of work experience. They feel they need to have the confidence and I'm doing that in inverted commas because I feel like it's a it's a feeling. It's there's no like you don't get an exam and then we, you know we you see can some do. people that have all the confidence and no idea. Yeah, like you, it, <laughs> it is just an internal measure. Yeah, we have had been speaking to someone recently. She has been a very high up board level finance director for a very long time, but she's now set up as a sole practitioner, and she will not call herself a finance director. She will not call herself an, a bookkeeper. She. She's struggled and we said, what was your last like role? What did someone else give you? And she said, oh, it was um, finance transformational director. And I'm like, she has all the ability, but it's just this internal. So we're like, how do we use a platform like Hey Monica with AI empowered technology to build confidence through doing the work? And yeah. That's what's- so AI is a work experience platform. It's probably a good way to describe yeah. it, which will give you based using AI, which we're training will be able to give you feedback on the the work that you are practicing. So, you know, if you do your exams and they give you like some numbers, it, you're going to kind of see those numbers, but you'll see them on like real pieces of paper, like the client would give you that messy file. Yeah. Um, yeah. Love that. And Fantastic. As a trainer, like that's, it seems like you're building a tool that can really be impactful for doing that because we're still training you in the old fashioned, it's a webinar or and everything else, but by the sounds of it, you're really looking at that platform right that's what you want to get we want them to get emails phone i mean if we can get phone calls whatsapps from clients saying like throwing a spanner in the works so that they go oh and then once they've dealt with it they go i dealt with it it's fine i've got the confidence i can do this with a real person now i know you kind of go give them like almost like a grade at the end or a certificate at the end is it so that other people can see them in the in the industry and be like, oh, actually, we could collaborate with them. Or is is that what we're trying? To that's do? what we'd like. That's the aim. We're still very early. This is new, but that is the aim. We'd like them to come out going like, oh, you know, I have been accredited as such yeah. by this, and or they need that. That's what they need. This certificate. They need the the tick yeah. in the box to say I've done this. And we will have uh, different clients, but it will be like VAT returns or self assessment tax returns. They will go. Because also there'll be people that are chartered accountants that have never done a VAT return before. Mm. So it will be, it's a confidence building for everybody. And is that for employees and self-employed? We saw it as a self-employed sort of gap that we needed to fill. But the more conversations we've had, the more people who are, you know, run big firms are saying, actually, I need this for my team. So I, we're in early stages. So at the moment we're building like a minimal viable product. We need to see... Is there really appetite? Because it's really easy to say, oh, we'll build something. And people say, oh, my gosh, that's amazing. I'd love that. But then when you actually ask people to put skin in the game and pay a bit of money for it, then you're going to have a different response. So we don't know yet. And I think I'm at the point, uh, I'm going to say this publicly and without like consulting the team, but I'm kind of at a point of if there isn't the appetite for it, we can't throw money yeah. at something that is going to not result in a, a good yeah, it's got to be a sort of hundred percent. We love to help bookkeepers, and because we do this from love, as we have to keep remembering, we're business owners as well. Yeah. 
So there will be a point where we have to make a decision, but I love what it looks like. I love the conversation. We're having fun we have. and we're learning and it's new, it's a new thing. And, and also we're not the experts. And this is the other thing. Yeah. We're showing people through the confidence journey that we don't know what we're doing, but we're willing to learn and we're asking other people and we don't know if it's going to work. And that's surely what we're trying to say with everybody else in business. Yeah, yeah. That like risk appetite. Oh my gosh, we've actually started a business and we don't know if it's going to work. (laughs) (laughs) And then get bring you back to relatability again, right? Because your bread and butter people are taking you know, getting taking that risk they're going to go out there with the same and you're, you're doing it again you've been there done the t-shirt multiple times but now you're doing it again with everything you've learned and push it through there and it just makes them more relatable doesn't it definitely definitely the overwhelming question that i always think here whenever we speak to people like yourselves is should the governing bodies not be doing some or all of this kind of support and stuff like or is it right that actually governing bodies do the the bare minimum, quite frankly, at times with their qualifications and stuff, and that we bring in private businesses mm. to deliver above and beyond that. When we started Six Figure Bookkeeper, we did approach a governing body about working together. We felt like there was a gap. That's why this all started. And they weren't interested. It wasn't in their plans. So that's why we ran with it. Yeah. I suppose it comes down to what are their goals like as a professional body? I don't know. I think it's also their skill set. They haven't run a profession. Uh, they haven't run a practice, mm. so it's not in their skill set. They don't know the answers. So I think we're asking them to know something that they don't know and help us with something that they've not had experience with. Do I think they should be bringing in experts and helping? Absolutely. I think it would be it'd be great. I think there's definitely a need for it, but I don't always know if if it's going to work like that. And maybe that's where. Me and Zoe always say, we're not here for the technical stuff. That's, and that's not our skill. So maybe they stick with that. Yeah. And they stick with the, the guidance and the, like, the legal side of things. Because yeah. we, we're like, oh, we don't. That's People our- have said to us before, you should start professional body. We're like, no way. No, <laughs> no, 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 thank you. No, thank you. It's not, so maybe we just stay in our lanes and um, we bring the best we can because we're focused on those areas. And I think the problem with the professional bodies at the moment is they're trying to cater for everyone, right? Yeah. So you've got people in industry, you've got people who've worked there, and it's not just the small practice. I know we talk about small practice all the time. That's what we want to support. That's what we want to help. But there's a whole other side of the accounting industry, and a lot of the professional bodies are trying to trying to juggle that, aren't they? And they're trying yeah. to do that. And unfortunately, it just feels like it's the small practices that are left behind, isn't it? And it's the biggest number, isn't it? It's massive. Yeah. And I suppose the other marketing opportunity or sales route for you guys with monica or hey monica is actually yeah you can you can do self-employed people you can do employed people Mm. but actually is there an earlier point in time in someone's career where this is used in colleges yeah oh yeah 100 percent. because they walk out with a bit of paper that says they're certified Mm. and then they go and sit in there for the first day and go oh my god God, I haven't got a clue. Yeah. Well, that's not what that VAT looked like on my ta- in my textbook. No. No. I went to my first job as a trainee accountant. I'd done a year of uni and I didn't know what spreadsheet was. <laughs> oh, God, no. I, worked, I worked as a trainee accountant for a whole year and didn't, couldn't figure out why I was there. <laughs> I didn't know what the pur- No one actually said to me what the purpose of a set of accounts was or anything. And all I kept thinking was, Debits and credits are different on my bank statement. I don't understand why it's the other way around here. Just remember it's the other way around. And this is the thing we say to people. If you're not ready to be self-employed, that's okay. Like we say about earning money from your bookkeeping skills. I have had multiple jobs. Mm -hmm. I have been a subcontractor multiple times. I worked uh, for an accountant for seven years at like £13.50 an hour. It's fine. It's okay. But just know it's like that you're doing it the right way and you're building it and you know and you're happy with it. Like, that's what we want. We want you to make money. We don't want you to feel like this is the hardest job in the world and I might as well go and work somewhere else. So that's what we're trying to say. But this confidence journey, and maybe this is the thing with the professional bodies, that is a completely different skill set other than making sure people are legal and above board. The confidence thing is a very different thing. And we've only, like, we've, we didn't realise that's really what we were doing until only recently. We're like, everything is disguised as pricing and sales and marketing and personal brand but it's all just confidence yeah and having confidence in each of those areas yeah yeah absolutely brilliant well thank you so much for joining us and sharing your journey for those of 
weird people in like some other country that's never heard of you because you know everyone knows who Joe and Zoe are. How can they get hold of you? How can they get access to your courses? How can they show interest in Hey Monica, etc.? Okay, so if you head over to our website, sixfigurebookkeeper.com, uh, there are two links at the top where you can join our free membership, which gives you access to some free training. It gives you the link to the community to come and join us in the Six Figure Bookkeepers Club. You also get a free copy of the Bookkeeper Rises. So lots of free resources there. Or you can find out more about the Bookkeepers Collective in there as well, which is our paid program. If you want to find out about Hey Monica, we're in really early stages. Actually, the best thing to do is be part of the Six Figure Bookkeepers Club because we are asking questions every day to help us train our AI and we'll be making all of the announcements there. So um, we'll keep you informed if you're in that group. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for being such cool of cool friends. <laughs> hopefully you'll enjoy your top trump cards going forward. Yeah, so hopefully, you. did you get anyone come and get yes. them signed from the Luca? Yeah, we had to sign cards yesterday. It was so fun. <laughs> It was definitely a uh, people coming up to us asking for your cards. So they're very oh, popular. Oh, that's cards. so yeah. nice. Oh, so sweet. I've never had to sign my autograph before. I like. I was like, I can't give them like my signature. <laughs> what do I do? The risk. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm just. I've signed fifty cards. <laughs> Wake up in the morning with twenty new bank accounts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she'll have nightmares now that she signed that one. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Thank you for being a cool friend of ours. Thank you for giving us your story and going from there. If you want any more videos like this, don't forget you're already in the right place. We've got plenty more cool friends along. I don't think they'll be quite as celebrity as this, but you know, they'll still be cool. <laughs> Very cool. I won't explain that to the other guests. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you both for giving us your time and I'm sure we'll see you soon. Thank yeah. you. Thanks for having us. Thank you.